Hi, I'm John Bevere. Welcome to the Gooder God Curriculum. You know, I'm so excited that you're embarking into this study of God's Word. I have to say, this message really impacted me personally as I wrote it. Now, as we begin, I want to encourage you, if you haven't done it, to get a hold of the book, Gooder God. Why? It's got interactive materials such as study questions, devotionals. It will help you to maximize the time that you're investing into this study. The final thing I want to say is please participate in group discussions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Others may really want to know what you're asking. So let's get right into it. Session one. I want to welcome you to session number one, and the title of this session is Good Enough. And so with that, I want to say this. A lot is going to be said here over the next six sessions. And my prayer is that you don't just get information, but God brings transformation into your life. And so I want all of us to pray together and really believe for God to speak to us. That's the most important thing that could happen because you're investing in your life to go through this curriculum. I'm believing God's going to change you forever. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, I'm asking you that you would fill this sanctuary, that you would fill every office, every church, every single home that is viewing this video curriculum right now with the presence of of Jesus. Holy Spirit, your favorite thing to do is to glorify Jesus, and I'm asking that you would do it. I'm asking that you would give me your word, the word of the Lord, the prophetic word of God for this time period we're in right now. And I'm asking that you would not only give me your word, but give me your heart to deliver it. Let it be as if Jesus was here delivering it himself. And Father, I pray that as we behold Jesus afresh and anew, that we would go from glory to glory, that lives would be liberated. For I decree this day that your kingdom has come within us, therefore your will shall be done in this place on earth as it is in heaven. And for this we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise and the thanksgiving. And it's in Jesus' mighty, wonderful, majestic, holy, awesome, magnificent name we pray. And everybody that agrees shouts, Amen. Let's give him praise for what he's going to do in our lives. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We're talking about is good enough. Now, let's talk about good and evil. All right? We all know the difference, right? I mean, isn't that correct? I mean, aren't we born with the knowledge of what's right and wrong? I mean, think about it. What movie, what story, what novel ever ended up with the bad guys winning? I mean, we watch the movies, we're cheering our heroes on, they go through adversity, but many times right at the very end, they come through and we applaud. If you look at the programmings that are on television, the last 10 years, the most popular programs on television have been the highlight of humanity's goodness. I mean, we saw makeovers. It started about 10 years ago with makeovers, and then we saw people helping people with weight problems, and then we saw celebrities coming in and finding people with voices and people that could dance. We saw people even helping find wedding dresses for people, and it just goes on and on and on. And so humanity loves goodness. We're attracted to good. And so we think, hey, we know what's good and we know what's bad. Nobody would be delusional and confuse good with evil. Nobody would be deceived and call that which is good evil or that which is evil good. But I want you to consider something. Years and years and years ago, a very wealthy ruler approached Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. And this wealthy ruler, he, was, he wasn't a murderer. He never committed adultery. He was honest in business, had never cheated, never lied, never defamed anyone, and he had honored his parents. And he comes up to Jesus, and he looks at him and says, good teacher. Now, this is leader speaking to leader. I'm sure this young, wealthy ruler wanted to gain some common ground with Jesus, so he called him good teacher. But yet, when he calls him good teacher, Jesus responds with this, why call me good? No one is good but one That is God. Now, why would Jesus correct this man for calling him good? Is Jesus not good? 
That is certainly not true. But what Jesus was saying to this wealthy leader was, your standard of good is different from my standard of good. I wonder how many of us would have fared in this man's shoes. I wonder how many of us, if you go way back a couple thousand years ago, would have looked at Jesus and said, good teacher, and we would have heard the same thing. I can honestly say as a leader, I think I know the response that I would have gotten because I did get this response. Let me tell you a little story of how God exposed in me that I had a wrong perception of what is truly good. Years ago, back in the mid-1990s, I was traveling to Sweden to do a conference. I had flown all night. When I landed in Sweden, the guy that was picking me up, he said to me, John, you probably don't know what has happened because you were on the plane, but Princess Diana was killed last night in an automobile accident. I was devastated. I couldn't even believe what my ears were hearing. I remember the man drove me to my hotel. When I got into my hotel room, I threw the luggage down on the floor. I'm still in my travel clothes from coming from the United States, and I turn on CNN and BBC, and I am watching in utter disbelief that this young woman's life was instantly and tragically taken. Now, I've got to tell you, Princess Diana and Charles were married about the same time Lisa and I were. And I remember Lisa used to follow them and I would follow them. Lisa would buy the magazines if she was on the cover. And I'll be really honest with you, I probably read them sometimes before she did. Because I really liked this couple. I thought she was a beautiful woman. She was using her beauty, her goodness to help humanity. I was impressed with what she was doing. I thought they were just a great couple. So it was kind of tragic to me when they ended in divorce And I remember I'm just sitting in front of the TV for literally a couple hours watching the news unfold, seeing the people outside of the gates laying flowers, weeping, writing notes. And I remember I thought to myself, you know, I'm speaking tonight. I need to probably turn off this program and get ready for the service. And so I turn off the TV and I'd been grieving, literally grieving in my room all day. But yet there was something going on. In my grieving, I sensed error. Now, it's a really hard thing to describe, but I just knew something's not sitting right here. So I'll never forget, after turning off the TV, I simply knelt down at the end of the bed in Sweden in that hotel room, and I said, Holy Spirit, I don't understand. I'm grieving over her death, but yet I feel like I'm in error. What's going on? I didn't hear anything other than read Revelations 18. Now, I have to say... I'm not a huge student of the book of Revelations. Don't get me wrong. I've read it and read it and read it. But I didn't know what Revelations 18 would read like. And I remember opening up and I started reading. I got to the seventh verse and I started seeing some things. And this is what I read. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously. In the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and I am no widow and I will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. The kings of this earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her. Now, let me say this right away. This was not historically written about Princess Diana. However, what the Holy Spirit was attempting to do with me is to draw a correlation. You know, when I looked at the scripture, I saw immediate correlations. First of all, she glorified herself. She proclaimed herself to be the queen of the people's hearts. She lived luxuriously. To say she lived luxuriously is probably an understatement. She said, you know, the kings of the earth, or actually the kings of the earth mourned when she died. And when this tragic thing happened, I remember seeing about every known leader or representative of a leader from the Western world at her funeral. And so I saw a direct correlation here. And so to be really honest with you, I was getting angry in my hotel room. I was like, God, how can you say this represents Princess Diana? There's just no way. And so I'm a little upset. I'm shocked and I'm a little upset. I'm like, no way. And I said, Lord, she's done so much good. She's helped the landmine victims. She's helped the orphans. And I heard this so clear in my heart. She flaunted her disobedience to her family's authority before the whole world. She bragged about her adultery to the entire world. She wasn't submitted to me. And I said, but God, all the good she's done. 
And I heard the Lord say this so clear. He said, son, it wasn't the evil side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Eve was drawn to. He said it was the good side. When I heard that, I flew my Bible over to Genesis 3, and sure enough, this is what I read. When she saw, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and desirable. So I saw the words good, pleasant, and desirable. She partook of the fruit. And I sat there with my jaw open, and I realized I didn't really understand what good was. You see, let me tell you something. God spoke this to me right after that. He said, son, Christian people, good people, quote, good people, they're not drawn to the evil, blatant sins of this world. They're not drawn to orgies and, you know, drug-infested parties. He said, there is a good that is not submitted to me that is actually rebellious to me. All of a sudden, I realized I don't have a handle on what really good is. And so it began in me a work that God began to do to understand that in these last days, what's really going to deceive people is not blatant evil. It's going to be a good that is blatant evil in God's eyes. And so there is a scripture in Proverbs 14 verse 12. It says this, there is a way that seems right. It seems good to man, but its end is the way of death. Now, let me talk about the way of death here, first of all. God said to Jeremiah the prophet, thus says the Lord, behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Now, when you think way of life and way of death, don't think death, dying, going to hell. The way of life that he's talking about and the way of death is the wisdom we live by. If you look at the garden where God brought me to, the tree of life represented God's wisdom. It was living in him. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented our wisdom apart from his. And you see, this is where the battle between man and his creator have been ever since. We think we know more than God knows what's better for our life. And so if we judge something to be good, and yet God says differently, there's a conflict. But if you look at what God says, because God is a redeemer, God makes this statement, happy is the man who finds wisdom. All the things you desire can't be compared with her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are those who retain her. You can see right there what God wants for your life. God wants for your life length of days, a long life. He wants riches and honor. He wants pleasantness. He wants peace. And he says his wisdom will give you that. But for some reason, we think that we know more than God what's good for our life. And so we end up many times blaming him when in reality, we're making decisions not based off of his wisdom that would give us these things. So if you look at the scripture again, it says there is a way that seems right. There's a way that seems good to a man. So in other words, the appearance, it seems beneficial seems strategic, seems acceptable, it seems profitable. However, according to God, the end is the way of death. Sickness, poverty, depression, sorrow, that's the way of death. There was none of that in the garden before Adam and Eve decided to impart their wisdom separate from God's. So the book of Hebrews tells us something that opens up our eyes even a little bit more. It says that the wise are those, in Hebrews 5, 14, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. According to God's word, your senses have to be developed to tell the difference between good and evil. Now, 
He's not talking about your physical senses there. Because at the very beginning of this exhortation, the book of Hebrews, he said to every one of them, he said, hey, I have much more to say, but your ears are hard of hearing. He wasn't talking about their natural ears. He was talking about the ears of their heart. And you have to understand that you have five spiritual senses, just like you have five physical senses. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord's good. How are you supposed to taste God? The Bible says this, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's not talking about these ears. He's talking about these ears. God says, in order to truly understand what good is and what evil is, you have to have your senses trained. So that brings me to the purpose of this message. The purpose of this message is to train us through the word of God to discern what is truly good and discern what is truly not good. Because if Eve could be fooled in a perfect environment and she was never abused by a dad, she was never taken advantage by a boss, and yet she got deceived to believe that what God called evil was good, then how much easier is it today when we live in a fallen society? You following me? How did the serpent do it? Let's just start right there. I mean, this is what God pointed me back to. I think we really need to ask ourselves, how can he get a woman who's in the presence of God every single day to get her to turn on God? Because if we can understand how he can do that, we can understand how he can get us to do it. So, What's going on here in the garden? Well, you know, God comes along one day and says, hey, you can freely eat. Now, this is what he says to Adam before Eve's taken out. He says, you can freely eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and bad. You must not eat of that fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. So God comes along and says, you can eat from any tree in the garden except one. So you have to look at his goodness. His goodness says you can have any, any tree you want. Now you gotta understand, there's over 2,500 fruit trees in the earth. And I'm sure each one was represented in the garden. So there is a couple thousand trees they can eat from. And God's goodness is saying, you can have any tree you want. And his authority said, except one. So what happens here? What does the serpent do? Well, first of all, he doesn't target Adam, he targets Eve. And there's a re reason for that, and I'll share it in a minute. And so the servant waits until she's there and she's looking at this tree and he says this to her. He says, so you can't eat from every tree, can you? So what does he do? What's the first step of his strategy? To get her eyes off of everything she can eat and get her eyes on the one thing she can't eat. I mean, how true is this for us? God has given us so much. I mean, if I was to stand here and to list all the blessings he's given us, we'd be here all night. We'd be here tomorrow. We'd be here the next day. I, could, I, I mean, the world of books couldn't contain everything he's done for us when you really stop and think about it. But what the enemy does is he gets your eyes off of all God's given you and says, look what you can't eat. You still with me? All right, so what's Eve's answer to him? She makes the statement. She said, we can eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Now notice her answer, nor shall you touch it. God never said anything about touching that tree. He just said, don't eat it. Now, this gives us a little insight. It gives us a little insight to Eve, okay? She's got communicated knowledge, not revelation knowledge. Now let's just go back here. When God originally spoke this, he spoke it to Adam. Eve's not been taken out. Now Eve's been taken out, and I'm sure Adam and Eve are walking through the garden one day, and Adam goes, hey, Eve, you see that one right there? Don't eat it from it. So she's got communicated knowledge. All right? Let me share with you how it happened in the Gospels. Jesus one day is with the disciples, and he looks at his 12 closest, and he says, uh, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So what do they start doing? They start saying everything they've heard everybody else say. Well, somebody said you were John the Baptist. Somebody said you were Elijah. Somebody said you were, you know, this prophet or that. And you know what they're doing? They're telling them everything they've heard on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. <laughs> and that's what Jesus wants. So he just draws it all out of them. And after they give all the things that they've heard everybody else say, 
Jesus looks at him and says, but who do you say that I am? So what has he just done? He's just stripped away all the communicated knowledge. And he said, what's in your heart? What has God revealed to you? And they're all sitting there like, oh my gosh. But Peter blurts out, you are the Christ. You are the son of God. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, you are so blessed because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. But my father in heaven revealed it to you. That was revealed knowledge. You see, how do we get revealed knowledge? Well, revealed knowledge can come in several ways. You know, it can come while we're reading the scripture. It can come while we're reading an inspired book, while we're quiet in prayer, listening to our pastor speak, receiving a vision like Peter did on the rooftop, or simply just encountering the word that God reveals to our hearts as we go through our day. There's so many different ways that God can reveal things to us. Okay, it's hard to articulate how it happens. Sometimes you may hear a still small voice in your heart. Other times you simply know because the revelation was just dropped into you. Other times your heart begins to race and you sense the presence of God as you read the scriptures. However it comes down, the bottom line is you know that you know. Now, on the other hand, communicated knowledge, this knowledge can be accurate, but the spirit hadn't revealed it to our hearts. Okay, let, let, me, let me give you an example of somebody who's got communicated knowledge. They accurately heard their pastor preach, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And so they didn't really seek God. They didn't really pray about it after the service. They just said, okay, I saw the scripture. And so they're out in their day and they go, hey man, you know money's the root of all evil. Don't be messing with money. Money's the root of all evil. Money's not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. What happened was they never really sought God If you look at the people in Berea, the Bible says that when Paul came and preached, it says the people of Berea were more open-minded than those of Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul preach the message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were speaking the truth. Now, notice that they were open-minded. In other words, they were like, God, we are open to what you are saying. And I'm going to tell you, that was probably one strong church. Because Jesus said, it's on this rock of revealed knowledge that I'm going to build my church. So it's not communicated knowledge, it's revealed knowledge. Are you following what I'm saying? Second phase of Satan's strategy is that he directly now contradicts what God says. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows In the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So hear the words for God knows. So in other words, what he's doing now by saying for God knows, he's saying, hey Eve, God's withholding something for you. There's something that he knows that you don't. So he's withholding something from you in that tree. So now, here comes step three. She's looking at the tree, and she sees it's good. She sees it's pleasant. She sees it will make her wise. And all of a sudden, she's thinking, wait a minute. What's he holding back from me? there, There is something good in that tree for me, and he won't let me have it. So what's he doing? He's perverting the character of God in her eyes. And he's making God look like a taker instead of the giver that he is. Once he can pervert God's character in her eyes, even in that perfect environment, he can get her to turn on him. There's something good in that tree that God's withholding from me. He's a taker. He's not as good as he made himself out to be. This is why the apostle James comes along in James chapter one, and I just think this is amazing. And he makes this statement. He says, do not be deceived. Everybody say deceived. Deceived. My beloved brethren. Now there's there's just really one problem with deception. You know what it is? It's deceiving. (laughs) The person who's deceived believes they're right when in reality they're wrong. He says, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good, everybody say good. good. Every good gift and every perfect gift 
is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. It doesn't matter how good it looks, how wise you think it will make you, how rich it will, you think it will make you, how good it will feel. If it's not from God, it's not good because there's nothing, nothing, what James is saying, there's nothing that is good for you, good for your life that is outside of God. Even Adam, both, remember Adam was with her when this happened. And I'm gonna tell you, talk about a man who should have helped his wife in a time of need. He should have helped right there. <clears throat> but once he got them to believe there was something good outside of God, they died. You seeing this? So, let's define what good is. Good is from the Greek Hebrew word tob, T-O-B. Now, the complete word study dictionary says... It's to be happy, acceptable, to do well, to do right. The Encyclopedia of Biblical Words goes a little deeper, and I love this, and I'm going to read the whole definition to you. The concept that links all these uses of good is evaluation. Everybody say evaluation. To determine good, one must compare things, qualities, and actions with other things, qualities, and actions. One must contrast the beneficial and the right with the other things, qualities, and actions that are not beneficial and are wrong. The account of creation introduces Tob big biblically as God views each day's work and pronounces it good. God too evaluates. It is in fact because God shares his image and likeness with mankind that human beings have the capacity to make value judgments. But sin has distorted humanity's perceptions. Because of this, only God is able to evaluate perfectly. Only because God has shared his evaluation of good in his word are we who rely on him able to affirm with confidence that a certain thing, quality, or course of action is beneficial. So the key word here is evaluation. Adam and Eve chose to evaluate what was good separate from God's wisdom. That was the downfall. That's the problem with humanity ever since. Again, I'm going to remind you of the scripture. There's a way that seems right. It seems good, but the end is death. So there's going to be ways, there's going to be behavioral patterns, thought processes, beliefs, acceptances of normal, customs, traditions that all seem acceptable by our own evaluation, but will eventually prove faulty in building our lives. And in time, they're going to take a toll on our life. So what is the standard of good that we are to trust in. Did you ever stop and think about it? What's our standard? Well, 2 Timothy, Paul, the very last letter that he writes before he goes to heaven, says this, all scripture. Everybody say, all scripture. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, or we could say good. To make us realize what is wrong, bad in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, bad, and teaches us to do what is right or good. Now look what he says, all scripture. Say it again, all scripture. All scripture. He's not saying some scripture. He says all scripture. Now this is the way I look at it, you know. Either all scripture is inspired of God or we've got a flawed book. Because if scripture says all scripture is inspired by God, then I can't just choose and pick and throw things out. So let's talk about the Bible. The Bible is composed of 66 books, correct? Written in various different languages, at least three languages that we know of, over a span of 1,500 years. 44 human beings authored those books over that span of 1,500 years in three different continents. You've got men from all different walks of life writing the same book over 1,500 years in different languages on different continents. You've got fishermen, you've got shepherds, you've got military men, you've got kings, you've got a medical doctor, you've got a tax collector, you've got a tent maker, and other unique individuals. The unity of the theme found throughout these different books is remarkable. It'd be kind of like if you had a committee and you told 44 authors over 1,500 years 
to write a novel? Could you even do that? I don't think you could. But the thing is, there was no committee. It was just 44 different men all throughout 1,500 years that wrote all these different books and all the books perfectly are in sync. Now, I wanna take it one step farther. Let's look at the accuracy of the Bible. If you look at the Old Testament, there were 300 prophecies written about the coming Messiah. Now, some of these prophecies were written over a thousand years before Jesus was born. And they, these 300 predictions, prophecies, said things unique to the Messiah. Now, Jesus fulfilled all 300 of these prophecies. That in itself shows the accuracy of the scriptures. I know some people would argue and say, yeah, but there's other people that could have fit some of the prophecies. Maybe one, maybe two, but certainly not 300. There was a scientist. His name is Dr. Peter Stoner. In 1958, he published a book called Science Speaks. Dr. Stoner this book was approved by the American Board of Science, and Dr. Stoner used over 600 science students to do his research. His research was probability. And so what Dr. Stoner did is he took eight of those predictions, eight of those prophecies. Number one, Christ is to be born in Bethlehem. Number two, he's going to be preceded by a messenger. Number three, he's going to ride in Jerusalem on a donkey. Number four, he's going to be betrayed by a friend. Number five, he's going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. The money for that silver is going to be thrown to a potter's field. Seven, Christ is going to be silent before his accusers. Eight, Christ is to be executed by crucifixion as a thief. He took those eight. And what they did is they did the science of probability of one man from the time of Christ till today, or up to his day, 1958, fulfilling all eight prophecies. Now, let me explain to you what the science of probability is. It's quite simple. If I have 10 tennis balls, and I have nine yellow, fluorescent yellow tennis balls, and one white tennis ball, and I put all 10 in a bucket, and I shake up the bucket, and I blindfold somebody and say, put your hand in there and pick out a ball. The chance of them picking out the white ball is one in 10, correct? Dr. Stoner and his 600 students determined that the chance of one human being fulfilling those eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. Now you say, what is one in 10 to the 17th power? Put a one on your paper and write 17 zeros behind it. Now I don't even know how to pronounce this number. It's gone beyond billion, so I'm, um, or trillion, I'm out of it but there's 17 zeros behind this one. Now, let me help you understand how big this number is. All right? I have a friend here, Don, and his wife, Sherry. They're from Texas. Because what we're gonna do is we're going to get some silver dollars. And we're gonna get one to the 10 to the 17th power of silver dollars. Okay? Now, and we're gonna mark one of those silver dollars. Now, the problem we're going to have is we don't have any warehouse big enough to store them. Because let me tell you how many silver dollars that is. If you were to cover the entire state of Texas, two feet deep, you could store those silver dollars. The entire state, two feet deep. So one of them's marked, stir the whole thing up, blindfold a man, put him in a helicopter, Tell the man to land wherever you want him to land over the entire state of Texas. And the chances of that man getting out and picking that one silver dollar is one in 10 to the 17th power. Now that is the chance that any human being could fulfill just eight of those prophecies. Now if we go just a little bit further, if we go to 16 of the 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled... It is, it's no longer one to the 10 to the 17th power. It's one in 10 to the 45th power. Now, it's going to be a little difficult. Just put a one on your paper and write 45 zeros. A little difficult to illustrate this one because if I take my silver dollar, we can't even contain it on the earth because if I had one to 10 to the 45th silver dollars, I would get a ball of silver dollars that was so big 
it would be 60 times greater than the earth's distance to the sun. Okay, so the diameter is 5.5 billion miles. To help you understand how big it is, you know, I fly around the earth in one day. Do you, do you know you can fly halfway around the earth in one day? 20, 22 hours, you can be on the other side of the planet. You can be in India in 22 hours. If we took off on a ball of silver dollars like that, it would, you couldn't do it because it'd take 400 years to fly around it nonstop. Now blindfold a man <laughs> and put him on that plane for 400 years and tell him, when to land, and don't forget, this is not two, two feet thick, the whole globe is silver dollars. He's got to find that one mark silver dollar. That's the chance that one person could fulfill 16 of the 300 prophecies. Jesus fulfilled all 300. Now do you know why the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 5, says every word of God proves true. I just want to end it with this. Consider a hypothetical situation. You're asked to cross a valley. In this valley are landmines, poisonous plants, sinkholes, quicksand, deadly, dangerous plants. Somebody hands you a map, and that map shows you where every sinkhole is, every quicksand pit is, every single poisonous plant is, every single landmine is. How would you handle it? Would you sit there and kind of glance at the map and then go on your journey? I guarantee you, they'll take you out of there in a body bag. Or would you study it out very carefully? And then as you go on your journey, having a place where you can easily reference it and you can pull it out and you can determine every bit of your journey so you get to the other side in one piece. Let me tell you something, this world is a landmine and God's given us a map because the Bible says your word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. And the question is, do we take it lightly? And do we look to him for his wisdom on what is the way of life? Or do we think that we know more than God and evaluate things according to our own personal judgment and end up like Eve? It's ours to decide, but I don't know about you, but I truly want to know what is good in God's eyes. Did you get something out of this session? See you next session.